Welcome, my dear students. You see here, it's written diabetes mellitus. I welcome you on this session. This is the second session on diabetes mellitus. The pathophysiology, the complications of diabetes mellitus, and the pharmacological actions of insulin, the mechanism of action of insulin has been discussed on the previous session. And for this session, we continue with the adverse effects of insulin. You know, the actions of insulin and naturally the first important adverse effect of insulin is hypoglycemia and we are much worried about this hypoglycemia because a sustained prolonged hypoglycemia can lead to brain damage so that's the issue of concern what are the factors which precipitate hypoglycemia number one is missed meal the patient did not take his meal at the decided time and in the decided amount so missed meal so patient has not eaten the blood sugar has not risen and on the top of it the patient has taken insulin that will precipitate hypoglycemia the second factor is inadvertent high dosage as you know the patients of diabetes are trained to take their own insulin diabetes is a question of anxiety worry and concern for the patient as well and naturally the patient keeps on adjusting his own dose and it could happen that the patient has taken inadvertently high dosage and this has led to hypoglycemia the third important thing is exercise or exertion yes the diabetic patient is advised to do a proper regular exercise but on a particular day if the patient does little more exercise then due to this exercise already the blood sugar has come down than what was expected and on the top of it the patient has taken the same dose of insulin is obviously going to lead to hypoglycemia so exercise and exertion and lastly the children are and old patients as well as the patients with renal damage they are more susceptible to get hypoglycemia. They need to recollect the factors precipitating hypoglycemia, missed meal, inadvertently high dosage, exercise, exertion, as well as the children, the old patients and the patients with renal damage. The lesson to learn is for, the, for a diabetic patient is don't miss a meal, do controlled exercise, don't do an excess exercise on a particular day, observe the right dosing and don't keep on changing your doses on your own Know the early signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and always carry glucose with yourself. Now, the patient needs to know what are the early signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. I take you to the next slide to discuss insulin hypoglycemia. The early signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia as well as the other signs and symptoms include lip and tongue tingling or tingling sensation in the lips and tongue, a sense of lethargy, weakness, uh, a sense of confusion and sometimes vertigo. This patient can have sweating, tremors, then tachycardia palpitation. Now, if the hypoglycemia is very severe and inadvertently high dosage has produced this hypoglycemia, sometimes the patient may not come to know and very rapidly the patient might progress into hypoglycemia. Finally, the manifestation would be coma and precipitation of seizures. What's the management of this insulin hypoglycemia? Obviously, if the patient is conscious, the first management is oral glucose. If this oral glucose doesn't work, the glucose has to be given by intravenous route. That will be about 50%, that will be 50% of glucose, 20 to 50 ml has to be injected by intravenous route or intravenous dextrose can be given. And we expect that this patient would respond and the hypoglycemia would be combated. However, if this is not possible, we have sec next option to go for is glucagon injection 0.5 to 1 milligrams by intravenous route or 1 milligram by subcutaneous route or it's also available by intramuscular route of administration as well as by inhalation. These are all the various routes for glucagon. The next option is to give a corticosteroids and that intravenous dexamethasone. Intravenous dexamethasone is going to prevent cerebral edema and it's got great value in the management of this hypoglycemia if it's not responding. And you also have an option of injecting epinephrine 0.2 milligrams by subcutaneous route of administration. So this was the discussion about insulin hypoglycemia. That's the first adverse effect of insulin. We progress with the further adverse effects of insulin and we go to the immunologic toxic effects. As you know, insulin can form antibodies and this can lead to one allergic reactions. Although the human insulins which are available nowadays are much less antigenic. 
the insulin resistance is classically defined as requirement of insulin more than 200 units per day and this could there could be decreased receptor number or decreased receptor sensitivity responsible for insulin resistance the immunologic toxic effect also includes the antibody formation as we said and the, this antibody formation as well as the conditions like systemic lupus erythematosus lymphomas mutations in the ppar and acanthosis nigricans are some associations of insulin resistance and as we already said insulin resistance is found to be much low with the human insulins the next adverse effect of insulin which was of much much concern in past when we had the older insulins was lipodystrophy or lipoatrophy of the subcutaneous fat however again this particular adverse effect has been much less with newer insulin and that's a great gift of newer insulin to diabetic patients that the patient doesn't have to suffer from the lipodystrophy or lipoatrophy some other adverse effects of insulin include presbyopia it also includes insulin neuropathy and lastly weight gain and edema can manifest on prolonged insulin administration apart from this not exactly lipoatrophy or lipodystrophy but you can get local injection site reactions due to the injection of insulin and sometimes the patient can complain of disturbed sleep and morning headaches now let's view some interactions drug interactions of insulin this is a diabetic patient he is on insulin treatment it's very essential to know what are the other drugs this patient is receiving number 1 most importantly the beta blockers beta blockers produce hypoglycemia on the responsiveness and this could be a dangerous situation let me describe it to you the patient is receiving insulin the patient goes into hypoglycemia normally if a person gets hypoglycemia hypoglycemia is a stress for the body and it's a stimulus for sympathetic activation or sympathetic stimulation what's going to happen when there's hypoglycemia there will be sweating there will be tremors there will be tachycardia there will be palpitation and the patient would get some symptom of hypoglycemia that's one thing second thing hypoglycemia is going to work as a stimulus for the adrenergic receptors which are present in the liver and due to the activation of the adrenergic receptors in the liver what's going to happen is the glycogen breakdown will start and the glucose will be brought to systemic circulation i hope you remember these are beta 2 receptors in the liver now what has happened in the current situation is something else if it's a normal situation and the patient is not receiving any beta blockers what's going to happen is the hypoglycemia will produce tachycardia palpitation anxiety tremors sweating so first thing is patient will come to know that there is hypoglycemia second thing which will be which will be happening is the beta 2 receptors in the liver will be stimulated and there will be glycogen breakdown and the glucose will be brought to systemic circulation so the hypoglycemia will be corrected so these two things these two mechanisms work when normally the patient gets hypoglycemia however we are considering a situation in which the patient is receiving insulin patient is going into hypoglycemia but the patient is receiving a beta blocking agent for his another cardiovascular condition say hypertension now what has happened is in a normal situation what that happened is the beta 1 receptors in the heart getting stimulated would have produced tachycardia palpitation sweating and the patient would have come to be known that there is hypoglycemia now what's happening is you have given a beta blocker so these beta receptors are blocked and the heart is not going to come to know about it and there will be no tachycardia palpitation anxiety sweating tremors so no symptom symptom less hypoglycemia that's very dangerous how the patient is supposed to identify that he's going into hypoglycemia so this identification will be lost so the body is not responding to hypoglycemia so i am calling it hypoglycemia unresponsiveness the second manifestation of giving the beta blocker is still worse the second manifestation is because you block the beta 2 receptors in the liver now they are not going to be stimulated and the breakdown of glycogen and bringing of glucose to the systemic circulation he is going to be prevented so two dangerous things happening at the same time number one you are not getting an alarm you are not getting a signal that there is hypoglycemia secondly your hypoglycemia 
is not getting corrected. That's very dangerous. So this patient could be having a blood sugar say of 40 milligrams per cent and there's no symptom. The person is sitting in front of you, the person is smiling. He never comes to know that there's hypoglycemia plus there is no correction of hypoglycemia. So this prolonged and sustained hypoglycemia in this way will be producing brain damage. And this is why beta blockers should be avoided in patients with diabetes mellitus. They are going to produce hypoglycemia unresponsiveness and I'm sure you understood what I said. The next interaction can happen with the drugs like thiazide diuretics, loop diuretics, corticosteroids and oral contraceptive pills. All these agents are in a sense diabetogenic. They are going to lead to increase in the blood sugar and this is exactly opposite effect of insulin. So your purpose of giving insulin to this patient with diabetes mellitus is not going to be subserved. So that's about thiazide and loop diuretics, corticosteroids and oral contraceptive pills. Next, very important, is acute alcohol ingestion. Insulin is controlling your blood sugar and it's trying to keep it to the normal level. On the top of it, if you ingest a large amount of alcohol, acute alcohol ingestion, and as you know, alcohol has got a predominant effect of producing hypoglycemia. So there's going to be this drug interaction with insulin. It's like additive effect of hypoglycemia and the patient will be having dangerous hypoglycemia. Next, there are few drugs which also precipitate hypoglycemia. This list includes salicylates, lithium and theophylline. Why? Because these drugs stimulate insulin release. And this is why there is going to be hypoglycemia plus you have already given your usual dose of insulin to your patient. So salicylates, lithium and theophylline can precipitate hypoglycemia. These were some important drug interactions of insulin. And now we move on to the insulin preparations. There's a chart here. Those who are interested in the history of the insulin preparations and those who want to know very basic things, this table will be useful. The left column is about the older insulin and the right column is about newer insulin. Let's view the slide. What we call older insulins, they, are mo they were mostly obtained from animal sewers. Whereas the newer insulins, they come from some from animal sewers, but nowadays more insulin, newer insulin from human sewers. Not only just human sewers, it is by recombinant DNA technology, that's by the method of genetic engineering. The next item, older insulins were coming from animal sores and actually they were more antigenic. The newer insulins are coming from human sores. Obviously, they are less antigenic. Older insulins used to have lot many impurities. So it was less pure. Whereas the newer insulin preparations, the purity is very high. Older insulins were less stable. The newer insulins are more stable. Older insulins obviously were less potent and the newer insulins are more potent. Once we say that there was antigenicity, it is susceptibility to having allergic reactions. So with older insulin preparations, you could have more incidence of allergic reactions. With newer insulins, the allergic reactions are much, much less. Next, because the older insulins were less potent, we were needing large doses of insulin. So that's called dose requirement. Dose requirement of insulin was more when we were using older insulins and for the same patient now if you go for a newer insulin the dose requirement will be less because the insulins are more pure. Next problem as we just discussed few minutes ago in the adverse effect is lipodystrophy. This lipodystrophy of the subcutaneous fat was a notable adverse effect with the older insulins and as I said and you can see this particular table I have shown three downward arrows to tell you that it is less, 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 it's much less. Lipodystrophy no more remains a problem with the human and with the newer insulins. Lastly, the older insulins had so many pH incompatibilities. We will come to this issue once again when we discuss the insulin preparations in details. Many times you need to mix two insulins and give them together because you have chosen a short-acting insulin 
and a long acting insulin or a short acting insulin or an intermediate acting insulin it's very essential that these two types of insulins are compatible with each other as far as the pH is concerned then and only then you can mix them in a syringe this problem was existing with the older insulin that there were too many pH incompatibilities with the newer insulin the problem of pH incompatibility has come down because many of them have neutral pH so that's the comparison between older and newer insulins and the next table is showing you the various insulin preparations now we don't think much about its older newer we are thinking about newer insulins now and what are the various options available what insulin preparations are available the first column is telling you the classification of insulin is from what class plus i'll try to give some important salient feature also the second column is about the onset of action the action begins in how much time and the third column is about the duration of action with all this we'll be trying to highlight all these insulins the first group of insulins is called ultra rapid acting insulins or ultra short acting insulins you understand the meaning of the term ultra we say short acting or rapid acting it is still rapidly acting acting for still shorter time will be called as ultra short or ultra rapid and their onset of action is about 15 minutes and the action last for about 3 hours we have three insulins in this group in the ultra rapid insulins insulin lispro insulin aspart and glulisin lispro aspart and glulisin and as you can have the look at the onset of effect is 15 minutes it means you inject and in 10 to 15 minutes it's going to start the action let's take the advantage of this particular property when a patient is going to eat his meal and just before the patient starts his meal if you inject this insulin it will be the ideal situation this insulin will be taking care of the postprandial hyperglycemia or the postprandial rise in the blood sugar postprandial is after the meals so because he is taking a meal whatever he eats he is going to produce an immediate rise in the blood sugar level so i am calling it postprandial rise in the blood sugar level and these insulins start acting within 15 minutes so they will be ideal to control the sugar which is going to be rising due to the meal so we give all these insulins at the beginning of the meal at the start of the meal so patient will take an insulin injection and the patient will start his meal so by the time he has his meals and he gets enough amount of blood sugar in the systemic circulation uh, these insulins will start their effect and you will get control of the blood sugar 15 minutes onset of action what's the reason of this because these insulin dissolves very rapidly at the injection site and the entry into circulation is two times fast two times more rapid as compared to what you call as rapidly acting insulins so that's about the ultra short acting or ultra rapidly acting insulins we move on to the next group on the next row and that is rapid acting and the rapid acting insulins are also called semi lente you have to get conversant with this terminology rapid acting insulins are called semi lente insulins or the rapid acting insulin is the classical regular insulin or crystalline insulin look at the onset of action for them it is 30 minutes that's half an hour and the action lasts for 6 to 7 hours the action lasts for 6 to 7 hours onset of action is 30 minutes so if the onset of action is 30 minutes they are ideal ideally suited insulins to be taken 15 to 30 minutes before meal so by the time someone tells you come on the table is ready but you always know although someone is, says you the table is ready that's a trick to call you on the dining table so that you can help so although if someone says the table is ready you don't go you take your insulin take your own time 
and go after 15 to 30 minutes and have your meal. So what has happened is you have taken your insulin 15 to 30 minutes before meal and the action will begin in half an hour, will be useful for the postprandial hyperglycemia and the action will last for 6 to 7 hours. I want to highlight something. If a patient is using this insulin, the action is going to last only for 6 to 7 hours. Is that enough for my patient? No. I want to have a longer duration of action. What could I do for this? What I could do is, I could give this rapid acting insulin. In addition, I could give another preparation which would be a long acting insulin. The long acting insulin obviously will not begin the action immediately. The rapid acting insulin will begin the action, will complete its action and before it completes the action, the long acting insulin will take over, it will start the effect and even after the action of the rapid acting insulin is over, the long acting insulin will be carrying the action forward and it will keep the action long lasting. So that's the usual way of managing a patient with diabetes. There's no use of giving just a long acting insulin or it's useless to give just a rapidly acting insulin. Most of the times a rapid acting insulin is combined with a long acting insulin or an intermediate acting insulin. So that is what is written on the last column is this rapid acting insulin is given together with long acting insulin. Let's move forward to the next row. The next row is intermediate acting insulin. The onset of action is about one hour. Action begins much slowly, that's one hour. And the action lasts for longer time and it could be 8 to 20 hours or 8 to 22 hours. And the name of the insulin in this group is Lente. Rapidly acting insulin is called Semilente. Intermediate acting insulin is called Lente. And one of the most popular insulins in this group is NPH insulin. What's this NPH? Let me explain it to you. N stands for neutral, P stands for protamine and H stands for hexdon. Do I write it for you? Yes. N is neutral. This word neutral indicates that it's got neutral pH. The next alphabet in NPH is P. I am writing protamine. What's this protamine? I hope you remember your general pharmacology. I have got a drug. It acts for a certain period of time. I want this drug to act for a longer period of time. What could I do? One of the best methods to do is to combine this drug with another substance. That another substance should be inert but it should be firmly binding to my original drug and then I inject this combination. After this combination goes in the muscle or say goes in the subcutaneous tissue as for insulin, the substance which is binding this insulin, my original drug, is going to release the insulin slowly in the circulation. It's going to hold it and slowly it's going to get released. And this is how I can prolong the duration of action of the original substance which I want to give. This is why most of the times insulins are combined with some binding agent. And when I am saying NPH insulin, it means this insulin is combined with protamine which is an inert substance and is going to release the insulin over a long period of time. So that's NPH and this is why I get the longer action and this insulin comes under intermediate acting insulins. What about the H, the last H? This H has remained in the name of the insulin since many years. It is in memory of the company which brought insulin to the market in the olden days. And the name of the company was Heck Dawn. So it's a respect, it's an honor and the insulin name is still NPH, Neutral Protamin Heck Dawn. I hope this NPH is quite clear to you. The next group of insulin is long acting insulins and they are called ultra lente insulins. And what's written in the bracket is PZI and here you have P 
again protamine Z Z is zinc and I is insulin it means now the insulin is combined with two agents one is protamine one is zinc due to this sperm binding insulin is slowly released and you get a long action onset of action of this insulin is 1 to 2 hours and the duration of action again 8 to 22 hours sometimes 8 to 24 hours so that's a long acting insulin and recently we had an addition to all these preparations that's the last group you see on this slide is called ultra long acting we had ultra short similarly we have now ultra long is going to keep on acting for a long time and the two types of insulins available their names are glargin insulin and detimir insulin glargin begins the action in 30 to 60 minutes detimir begins the action in 1 to 2 hours but really there is nothing like beginning the action as soon as this insulin goes inside it starts producing the action and the action lasts for 24 hours the speciality of these insulins is they don't give the dose response curve which is which is steep they produce a flat dose response curve which means the insulin levels are constantly maintained there is nothing like peak of the insulin level and that's why sometimes they are called as single peak insulin or peakless insulin so these are all the insulin preparations which are available according to their duration of action we will continue the discussion on another session with further issues on insulin preparations thank you very much